People gather around Jesus as his reputation becomes known from town to town. As we gather virtually, we too are yearning for presence, for peace, for help. We continue our Lenten season of healing as we focus on health as an essential component to our spiritual lives. And today we'll be focusing on our intellectual health. All these pieces is broken and scattered In mercy gathered and made in more So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel For what to see, your love in me Prolonged times of difficulty can impede ability to stay creative. The picture of our lives is dull and a hope for a brighter future can fade. We need a touch of inspiration to awaken us from our sleep as we hear in one of this week's healing stories. We also awaken to our agency to seek out the divine healer, reaching out to touch the power we know can restore our intellect and imagination. We emerge ready to re-engage with the world, seeking and seeing solutions, creating different pictures of life renewed, just as a mosaic artist creates beauty from broken pieces of glass. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy. People opened their lives to Jesus. We are drawn to the healer, opening our hearts with honesty about our lives and finding assurance that offers peace. Let us acknowledge our need to restore, repair, renew our holy vessels so that we might be able to create and imagine new possibilities. Let us pray. God of all possibilities made in your image, you've tasked us as co-creators of a better world. You bestowed imagination and ability to learn and progress. But during this pandemic, we have grown tired. Our energy wanes and sometimes our enthusiasm. The call for ideas, solutions, workarounds, and adaptations has been nonstop for us all. Whether we're needing to find ways to keep children engaged and well, or figuring out how to maintain a passion for our work in the midst of trying times, or needing desperately to undo systems of oppression too long affecting our lives and lives of our neighbors, Holy God, not only our livelihoods, but our liveliness is at stake. Often we've wanted to give up, declare all too hard and simply isolate, waiting out the time for better days. We confess it feels overwhelming and we often look away, sometimes even from the need in our community Help us, healer. Show us our energy reserves. Forgive our cynicism. Move us to take one step at a time toward greater care for one another. And let us take a moment of silence as we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Hear these words of assurance. Know this, we are gifted with agency to affect healing 
in the world, no matter what. We're not alone, and we can join with others to magnify hope. Christ will answer when we call, when we reach out for what we know. Christ can help for you, for me, for everyone. Take a deep breath in to let this truth fill you. <sighs> and breathe out with the relief of assurance that we are held by Christ and healed and equipped to be agents in the world. And now, with the assurance of God's love and grace, I ex invite you to extend God's peace to those who are in the room or perhaps on the Zoom, if you can see some of your other sisters and brothers. Um, so I would say to, uh, to Beth, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you, David. And Owen, may the peace of Christ be with you. And my friend Stan, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's join together with the choir now and sing this lovely hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. People were fortified by Jesus's words and deeds that revealed care for all, especially those marginalized. We strengthen our belief in the possibility for renewed health and vigor for all. And so now we move on to the children's time. So I invite all the children to come into the room, young and old. There'll be something for everyone in this. So. We have been uh, looking at experiencing God's love in various ways and experiencing healing in various ways. And a couple of weeks ago, we, we talked about breathing as a way to experience healing. And today we're gonna focus on praying as an act of healing. And it's uh, wonderfully reassuring to know that no matter what we're going through, we can always turn to God in prayer. We can ask God's help for ourselves and for others. And God, like any true great healer, listens, and God always hears our prayers. And so today I'd like to uh, teach all of you a 
often when we do prayers with uh, hand motions, it helps get it in our heads. And David does the Jesus prayer with us a lot. And this is a little different take on a prayer that has hand motions with it. So the words are on the screen and it goes this way. It's loving God. We come to you with hearts. So place your hands over your hearts and hands and raise up your hands, minds and souls in need of your healing touch. Heal us from the inside and breathe in, out. <sighs> so that we may reach out to help heal your world. Amen. So let's try that again all together. I invite you to do the motions with me at home. And when you breathe in and out, like breathe, really breathe in deep, filling your lungs, remembering that when we're breathing in, we're breathing in not only oxygen, but we're breathing in God's spirit. And then as you breathe out, just let it sigh so that we're just sending God's love out into the world. So loving God, we come to you with hearts, hands, minds, and souls in need of your healing touch. Help us heal from the inside out <sighs> so that we may reach out to help heal your world. Amen. First contemporary reading is from an anonymous author. Curiosity is the first step down the path of awakening. I dream of a church where everyone is welcome. I dream of a place we all can call home. I dream of a world where justice is flowing, with hope and peace growing. Amen. Oh, wow. Those chords are just amazing, Owen. Just a great song. Your voice, the lyrics. Um, amen. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 18 to 26. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. 
and instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up, and the report of this spread throughout that district. May God add a blessing to today's readings. So today, my friends, we continue the series on healing, uh, holy vessels. This is a season of healing and recovery during Lent as we prepare ourselves for the season and celebration of Easter. So just as a reminder, this series contains six dimensions of healing, physical healing, emotional healing, the well-being and health of our community, the well-being and healing of our planet, and a way in which we integrate all of these things together in my final sermon before Easter. But today we're gonna to be focusing on the importance of intellectual health, our brain power. And there are two key pieces to our intellectual health. One is curiosity, and the other is creativity. I wanna tease out why it is that curiosity and creativity are part of the healing story which happened today and how it is that it will speak to us in our time and place. So what was healed in this text that Carolyn just read, by the way, on the occasion of her birthday in keeping with um, Barbara Peck's tradition of reading scripture when it was on or about her birthday. So Carolyn, thank you for that and happy birthday. Matthew 9, 18 through 26, once again, there were two healing stories. One of them had to do with people thinking that a young girl, the daughter of a synagogue leader had died, and chronic illness. Those were the two healing stories. Again, as we have seen in so many of these pericopes, these passages, two things happening at once. So let's talk about the first healing. This powerful, influential man, the leader of a synagogue, comes to Jesus and asks Jesus to come to his home because his daughter has died. And he says to Jesus, come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now on his way to make this happen, a peasant woman, now just remember that in Jesus' time, a peasant woman with a 12-year hemorrhage would have been considered unclean by her religious community, in which case she would not be able to participate fully, nor would she even be considered a full member of that religious community and would have been pushed out, isolated. We all know what isolation feels like, so we can identify with this woman. But she thinks to herself, rather than some of the other healing stories where people say words outside or maybe they don't say anything at all, she thinks to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I'll be made whole. I'll be made well. What was Jesus' action? In the first story, he didn't even say anything to the, the synagogue leader. He simply, the text says, he followed the man. But the action with the second healing in the midst of this resurrection story Jesus turned and actually spoke to the woman and what he said is absolutely essential. Take heart, in other words, be renewed, think about what's happening right now. I am calling you daughter, which means you are now a member of the family of God. Your faith has made you well and instantly she was healed. Now the end of the story when Jesus arrived at the leader's home, the wake had already started. The flutes were playing and mourners were gathering and there was a big crowd in the home and Jesus says, go away, the girl isn't dead, she's sleeping. Now, our 21st century minds can get so wrapped around the, the, the literally, the literacy or literalness of this death and sleeping image. Remember that Jesus was speaking to his audience and he, Matthew was speaking specifically to make connections about who Jesus was and what he was capable of doing. 
It's very important not to dismiss the story by thinking, oh, there's no way Jesus could have brought some dead girl alive again. Maybe, maybe not. But what he says is, she's not dead, she's asleep. And everybody got a great guffaw out of it. <laughs> really? You think you're going to be able... But when the crowd had been put outside, Jesus went in, took her by the hand, and the girl got up. Now the takeaways for us is that this is a resurrection story. Let's call it a resurrection sandwich story because you have the beginning of the resurrection and you don't have the resurrection until the end of the story. And in between, you have this lovely story of salvation. Now, we don't tend to use that word too much in the United Church of Christ, but this is an example of how a person's life was literally saved by Jesus' words to her. And her healing was not just her physical body, which gained uh, vitality again, but her welcome to her community was restored. And what was resurrected was a state of wakefulness from sleep. So here are the implications for our intellectual healing for today. These two healing stories collide to provide us the renewal we need for intellectual healing. Because I'm guessing, my friends, that the pandemic has felt like a chronic illness. Now, maybe we haven't been physically bleeding, but there's a way in which, I don't know about you, but my soul, my spirit, my head have become somewhat anemic. So this story speaks directly to our weakness, lack of vitality, the way in which this has been a chronic grind down. Can I get a witness on that? Yeah. Amen. Okay. Long suffering can put us to sleep. So the good news of this healing story is that God is with us to wake us up and inspire curiosity and creativity. Here's a tangible illustration of how I see this happening in the world today. There's been so much conversation among all of our folks e everywhere. Everyone's talking about the vaccine, the rollout of the vaccine. Some people are thrilled. Some people are frustrated. Some people are anxious. Some people probably have fallen asleep until it's their time, which may be a while. That'd be Owen and me and everybody who's under 45 with no pre-existing conditions. By the way, write a postcard to the governor and the, the, the Department of Health here in Washington County and say, clergy are essential health care providers because currently we are not on the May 1 list. So take action. That's one way you can inspire your curiosity and your creativity to help um, clergy, not just me, but all clergy. So there is this momentum going in our culture right now. The level of excitement um, it, it is palpable. Hey, we can see that this is happening. The fist bump here, I think, is just absolutely, you know, just sort of speaks to the way in which we're feeling this positive energy coming. And here's the concern. We have bottled up our feelings for so long that I'm afraid that this momentum might cause like a break in the dam. And all of a sudden we think, oh, we're out of the woods. Everything's going to be fine. We just start doing what we want to do. We take off our masks. We ignore social distancing. We come back to the church. Isn't it terrific? Everything's going to get back to normal again. Not quite. The next couple of months will be absolutely essential in using our creativity and our curiosity to figure out how it is that we negotiate these next few months with a sense of anticipation and hope, but not with silly steps that will essentially ruin all of the work that we've done by isolating and wearing masks and washing hands and keeping social distance. My friends, it's important to stay the course at least for a little while. However, that's not to say we're going to just do nothing. We're going to be channeling our curiosity and our creativity towards, we've, and this has already begun, a phase forward plan. And what this means is that we hope to be as clear as we can about the vision of what hybrid church would look like for Bethel. 
how would it work? Now, when I say hybrid, I'm talking about when we get to the place when we can have people physically here in person, and yet we're still live streaming because we know that there are folks who either can't or unable or, or who still aren't feeling comfortable gathering in large groups. So there will be these two congregations, the one that's in the room and the one that we have here today. So we're going to need to work back from what we want that community to look like and make plans. We need to integrate these two congregations. I got this from a, a Zoom meeting that I attended this past week with uh, ministers from around the conference. And, and, and all of a sudden it occurred to me that part of this plan, part of this curiosity, part of this creativity is going to be how is it that as a leader of this congregation, how is it that Owen is a music director. How is it that Beth is program coordinator? How is it that we're going to be able to integrate these two congregations? I kind of knew it intellectually, but all of a sudden I realized this is going to be a new opportunity for creativity and curiosity. We're going to have to pay attention to volunteer and staff capacity. Now that sort of feels like a no-brainer or a breaking down a door that's already open, but I think it's important uh, to remember that, that we will have to be mindful of volunteer and staff capacity. We also have to forget that there are some who haven't been vaccinated and may not be able to get vaccinated, not, not because they're obstinate or they're not con or, or they don't believe in the vaccine, but they may have underlying health conditions that make it unsafe to take the vaccine. So we have to be mindful of folks who haven't yet been vaccinated. And however we do this phase forward, it has to be consistent with our values, with our mission. Now, there's leadership for this. We have our moderator, Paige Angst, and we have Mac McPherson, who's a member of the board and chair of the Face Forward Committee, and we have yours truly, and Beth, and Owen, and Courtney. So we have a core leadership that's going to begin the work of this Face Forward, and yet we're going to need the help of the whole congregation. So I invite you to ponder these questions. And you'll be seeing more of them. This isn't just a one-time thing. You'll be seeing these questions throughout the spring and perhaps the summer. So if you think about our life and mission at Bethel, what's something you did before the pandemic that you are looking forward to doing again? As it pertains to life at Bethel, I can think of at least three things right off the top of my head. First, I'm looking forward to hugs. <laughs> Second, I'm looking forward to singing. Third, I'm looking forward to being able to greet people in the fellowship hall so that it doesn't feel like I have 30 seconds to connect with people at the door. Those are the things that I'm looking forward to, and I'm guessing you could add to the list. This, for me, is the easiest question. Here's the next question. What's something you started to do during the pandemic that you hope to continue? Now for me, one of the things that I've noted, and I've mentioned this before, is that the book study groups and the conversation groups around movies and other topical thematic uh, groups we have actually been better attended, attended when we do Zoom rather than meeting in person. So I suspect that we're going to make some good decisions around, for example, does every committee have to meet in person in the Narthex conference room, or is it easier for us to meet via Zoom. It's not to say we never meet, but perhaps quarterly we meet in person. What's something you did before the pandemic that you want to let go of? This is probably the trickiest one from my perspective. What's something you did before the pandemic that you want to let go of in terms of your life at Bethel? What's something you started to do during the pandemic that you will be happy to stop wearing a stinking mask is something <laughs> I am looking forward to. And yet we know it could be another year or two before we get rid of the masks because it is too important to jeopardize our physical health which will then impede our spiritual health, our emotional health, our intellectual health, everything. 
What is something you started to do during the pandemic that you will be happy to stop? I will be happy to stop being suspicious of every person that I see in the grocery store wondering if they've had their shot or if they're wearing their mask correctly or I give up the judgment on somebody who's wearing a mask and their nose is sticking out and I want to give them a piece of my mind. I would like, I would be glad to stop that. Anybody else happy to stop some of that stuff? So this intellectual, focus on intellectual health, Marsha McPhee talked about creating a different picture of who we are. And I think that means both the picture of who we are as a church and a picture of who we are as individual people. And so I spent time finding a picture which I think in some ways integrates the symbols of our Christian faith. So here you have a little child. You'll remember that there's something in Scripture about, and a little child shall lead them, which we celebrate every Advent. Here's a little child, and the message from John's Gospel is, Christ is the light of the world, and the light has not been put out and will not. Here's a light. And in the backdrop, it's quite dismal. And it's actually almost apocalyptic looking. It's a, it's a town, it's a city in, in shambles. And I think that represents some of the ways in which we are feeling like we are in shambles. And yet, that lantern, that light, remember in the Gospels it says, don't hide your light under a basket, but put it on a stand for everyone to see. Here is this child putting out his light and looking what it's showing. It is showing resurrection of flowers in bloom. There is color, there is greenery in the midst of that desolation. There is hope. And if you look very carefully, instead of that being a moth that's coming close to the lantern, I believe it's a butterfly that's coming close to the lantern, which is counterintuitive because you wouldn't expect to see a butterfly at night. And yet, butterfly is another one of those examples and symbols of resurrection. So my friends, the good news is that God will continue to be with us. He will wake us up from our sleep from this pandemic, will inspire us to use our brains with creativity and curiosity so that we can be God's people in the world today and in the days and weeks ahead. May God add a blessing to the hearing of this word and how it may percolate the good news in you throughout the week. And the people were heard to say, Amen. Amen. Holy God, knit us together with that ancient prayer, knowing that we'll be able to continue our prayers throughout the week. But for now, we knit ourselves together across generations and across the world today with other Christians who share that prayer that Jesus taught the first followers, saying, Our Father, Father mother, mother, who art who in heaven, heaven, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we, we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against, against others. Us. And, and lead us not, not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and, and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen.
The parting words Jesus gave to those he healed were often as much balm as the healing act itself. We hear words of encouragement from the one who makes beauty from brokenness. This week, our ritual action uh, hinges on the words that Jesus spoke. The girl isn't dead. She's sleeping. And we've touched today on our need to be rejuvenated in spirit, to awaken with new vigor for creativity and curiosity. This is the intellectual healing that is spiritual healing. We may feel like we've been slowly dying away these last few months, but Jesus affirms that we are not dying. We may be sleeping. It's the healing we yearn for to be awakened, brought back to life with vitality and vigor for the days ahead. And so, as we have been doing in past weeks, I encourage you to consider how you might use your beach glass if you have that with you. And one of the things that I, I suggest that you do today is if you're in a place where you can put your beach glass out on a table, I would encourage you to play with it. And I've done this with my confirmation class with other kinds of things that you, you're never quite sure if you just let the Spirit guide you um, what it is that the picture that God wants for you as you play around with this beach glass, it may show you something about how God is picturing you. And it may be hard for Owen to capture this, um, but what actually spoke to me in the shape uh, is the shape of a cross. Um, and Christ's head is like a diamond at the top. So if you have your beach glass, I would encourage you to make play with it. See if spirit will guide you. See if curiosity and creativity will just kind of come out of you. And if you're inclined, take a picture of it and share it with your friends. You could share it on our Misfits page. Um, you could share it on Instagram, uh, whatever kind of social media you use. And if, you, if that technology is not part of your world, then simply leave it on a table somewhere where you'll see it frequently. Because there is so much power and creativity um, and curiosity when we use tangible things to move around and help, help us see and, be reveal, and have God's love reveal for us in the way in which God may be envisioning us to be new. Scriptural accounts of healing often end with responses from the crowd of witnesses. How will we proceed into the brokenness of this world and respond as the body of Christ? Of course, the interesting thing from the story we looked at today was that the, the response from the crowd was laughter. And it wasn't laughter that's joyful and life-giving. It was laughter that was um, accusatory and actually picking on Jesus. So there are plenty of things to laugh about and to give thanks for. Laugh with, laugh at yourself, and enjoy others' humor as a way of knowing that this is a gift from God. And I mention that now because it's so important for us to continue our ministry here. And as always, it takes finances to be able to do this. And you have been very generous. We encourage your continued generosity. You can mail your offering to the church using the good old snail mail. It takes longer than usual, but it still gets here. You can go to the website and click on Give at the top of the page of the website. Or you can use this cell phone number or phone number, 503-751-8711, and text your giving to that. Would you join me in the prayer of dedication? Holy God, we trust that with this virtual technology, you still draw us together. You still bless our lives. And you still inspire us 
to share and to give perhaps even more since we recognize how important it is to be a community, how important it is to have hope that we will be able to gather again, perhaps not like before, but in ways that you will help us create. We trust you. We believe in you. We know that your blessing is upon our lives and the gifts that we give this day and in the week ahead. In the name and in the spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's join together with the choir on this final hymn. It's called Give Us Vision. Love that song. <laughs> so each week we look at the reaction of the crowd and the healing story. And this week there's an interesting reaction at Jesus' notion that the girl was not dead. As I said before, they laughed. Full blown funeral rites had begun, the flutes and all. And Jesus said, this is not the end of the story. The idea that we could come back to life before than, better than before, that we could find some way to bring life back to what feels dead, may seem preposterous to some at this point, laughable. But, like Jesus, we need not be deterred. Can we forge ahead, enter the house of sorrow, and dare to proclaim that life still exists? Go with confidence, my friends, that we will awaken. We will seek out, reach out for the healing solutions that our neighbors, our communities, our world needs. Recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears. You are not dead. Maybe sleepy. And may the Spirit hover and move and deliver salve to your soul and spring to your step. In the name and Spirit of Christ we say together, Amen. Amen. Here's this lovely refrain from one of my favorite songs, Here I Am, Lord. Let's sing this together as a musical exclamation point. I hope that you'll stick around for our virtual coffee time. There will be smaller groups. Beth 
we've become expert at breaking people up into smaller groups and having opportunity to have conversation and to share one another's lives and to be a community of faith. So I hope that you'll stick around. We also know that there may be some of you who are visiting with us today, and if you would like to know more about the life of our congregation, simply go to our website, which is www.bethelbeaverton.org, and you'll find something that says Weekly Highlights. If you click on that, that's our Friday virtual electronic newsletter, and it'll help you with links to everything that's happening in the life of the church. And next we'll listen to Chad. Thank you for that chat. I definitely want Jesus to walk with me and I hope that you'll stay tuned and walk with each other for our coffee fellowship time. It'll take Beth a couple of minutes. We have to do some transitioning. I have to change mics. Um, but I also at this point want to give a big shout out to Stan Davis who has been faithfully coming week after week uh, to do the filming for this. And, uh, and, and Owen has, um, has been trained by uh, the, the artful Dodger, Stan Davis. And uh, so hopefully Stan will get a Sunday off once in a while. So we're very grateful to Stan and for all of the good work that he's done. Uh, his post, uh, his post um, production videos are just terrific. So uh, can't say enough, Stan. Thank you very much. <laughs> 